this small child, this tiny, fragile life, carries with it the hope of all humanity. This small voice, now crying out in dark chambers, will one day still the raging sea, will call forth the dead to rise and live. This voice will declare it is finished and shatter the grip of sin. These small hands, now grasping for comfort, will one day restore sight to the blind, will break bread and feed the multitudes. These hands will feel the piercing cold of an iron spike and bring salvation through surrender. These small feet, now wrapped in cloth, will one day travel countless miles upon dusty roads, will stand firm upon rushing water. These feet will crush the snake's head and step forth from an empty tomb victorious. This small child, this wondrous, perfect gift, is Jesus, our Savior, the promise of eternity.
Good morning, everybody. Join me in prayer. Father God, thank you so much um, just to be able to be in your presence this morning. Father God, speak to, speak to us this morning. Father God, remove anything you need to for you to be able to get to us this morning. Any thoughts that we don't need to have, anything that we've been going through right now, Father God, it's not that we are forgetting them because we know you're not forgetting them. Let us just hear what you want us to hear this morning. Father God, let us see what you want us to get today, but also what you want us to take going forward to do nothing but glorify your name. Father God, open up that everything, open up everything that needs to be open for us to just and take as much as you today as we can handle, as we want, as you want us to have, to go out and be great examples of you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, good morning again, everybody. So today we are continuing our series people, the people of Christmas. And today we're going to look at a man that was not good, that did not want God, and did terrible things against everything about God, everything, his or every single thing about him. You've seen how Pastor took the good one last week and gave me the bad one, but that is okay. I can deal with it. And what we're going to see today is what I think uh, certain things that he does, this man that we'll be talking about, are certain things that we unfortunately do in the same situations. This is a man that ordered the killing of innocent babies that you guys might be thinking for that are familiar the story. We, am I saying that we're doing that? Of course not. I'm not saying anything like that. But what I am saying is the way that we respond to things of God, especially when we say we're believers, are sometimes in the same way that others that don't claim that respond when it shouldn't be. Because if we claim to have Christ, we have the Holy Spirit in us. So there are certain situations that we are supposed to respond differently. Sometimes we just don't. So today we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 2. And again, if some of these verses are familiar, a lot of them are the ones we looked at last week. Pastor went over uh, some of them last week that we talked about the wise men. We've seen how they saw the sign, how they gave what they gave to Christ what they had and how they went to worship the Messiah when they finally knew where he was. So today we're going to learn about a man who tried to prevent all of that from happening and simultaneously see how his attributes with dealing with God are some that unfortunately we share in some of the same situations. So today we're going to look at four questions that I want to wrap around our minds that we see from the text and see if our answers are different than the villain that we're going to talk about. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to Matthew chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 1 to 8, and then go down to 16 to 18. Starting verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judah, in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born King of the Jews? For we saw his star at its rising and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. So he assembled all the chief priests and the scribes of the people and asked them where the Messiah would be born. The prophet, <clears throat> excuse me, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, and by no means least among the rulers of Judah, because of out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men and asked them the exact time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. When you find him, report back to me so that I too can go and worship him. And in verse 16, 18, then Herod, when he realized that he had been outwitted by the wise men, flew into a rage. He gave orders to massacre all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and younger in keeping with the time he had learned from the wise men. Then what was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be consoled because they are no more. So the first question I want to ask us, I want us to ask ourselves, is are we afraid to hear about God? Verses 1 to 3 again. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judah, in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born King of the Jews? For we saw his star at its rising and have come to worship him. 
When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. So we get to the guy of our story very, very quick. King Herod of Judah. So who is actually this king? There's a lot of history on here, so we're not going to go over it, but a brief summary of him. King Herod was king of Judah for 33 years, and his father was good friends with Julius Caesar at the time. So that kind of got him in the door to be able to even be able to become king. He became governor of Galilee in 47 BC, and after having a successful reign for about 10 years, that's how he worked his way up to be king of the Judea, around 37 BC. He was, mostly, he was mostly a hated tyrant, known for being brutal and forceful in his reign, but he was the king. And in those days, if you were king, the authority you had, you were almost like a god in their eyes. And the wise men in verse 2 say, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star at its rise and have come to worship him. And then verse 3 says, When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed in all Jerusalem with them. Why was he disturbed? Why does he care? The word disturbed in this verse is the Greek word terasso. I think I pronounced that right. And another meaning of it could be to strike one's spirit with fear or dread or to render anxious or distressed. You know where else we see that word at in scripture? Matthew 14, 26, Jesus walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terassos, terrified. To ghosts they said, and they cried out in fear. Luke 1, 12, when Zechariah saw the angel Gabriel, when Zechariah saw him, he was terrified, terassos, and overcome with fear. Herod is afraid that the Messiah is here. Why? Because if the people are worshiping the king of the Jews, then they're not going to be worshiping the king of Judea. Herod was a king, but he wanted to be the king. Herod had worship, but he wanted all the worship. Herod was not content with what he has been given. He wanted what was not intended for him. And because of who he is, the rest of Jerusalem couldn't even enjoy this. Then the verse 3 says, and all Jerusalem with him, they were disturbed. Why would Jerusalem be troubled over the Messiah being able to come? Because they knew what was going to happen in their land if their king knew another king was coming. They have seen what Herod has done in the battles before all of this, the reason he was able to get to power. And they couldn't even enjoy the event of all events. So they can't even get excited of the king of the Jews actually coming because they know how their life is going to be affected because of the king that they are under right now. So the way we react to God affects not just us. It also affects the others around us. Our families are watching to see how we handle dramas. Our job is looking at us to see how we handle certain situations. The people at the store in line are looking at us when the cashier messes up. How you respond to God shows others how they are supposed to respond to God. Especially when we're someone that people are looking up to. Side note, if we're in a position of power, people are always watching to see what and what we do and how we respond when a situation comes up, especially if we claim to be father, followers of Christ. The world wants us to do what's best for us. That's what they're looking for. But as believers, they're look as believers, they're looking at us to do what's best for God, what He would want us to do in that situation. We can affect others for good and for bad with what we do and what we say. When someone talks to us about God, how do we handle it? Do we not take them seriously because they're just not that strong of a believer? Maybe they're not in the same walk that we're on and their questions are kind of just, uh, so we don't invest that much into those kind of conversations. We kind of just brush them off. Or do we completely shut down when it's somebody that we're intimidated by? They might get to those questions that we just flat out don't know the answer. And so instead of responding with anything, we almost don't respond with anything. What if someone's calling us out on something that we know we really shouldn't be doing? We've had some questionable things and somebody is letting us know, hey, this Christ that you claim to follow 
these actions don't really follow it. What happens when they bring those things up? When we're presented with anything about the God that we believe in, we should not, excuse me, we should not respond by being deeply disturbed or anxious or terrified. We need to be responding with an attitude of love. When someone's coming to us and they're not as long, far along in the walk that maybe we are, we need to remember that that was us before we are where we are right now. Rather, it's a kid just getting it, just asking these questions, or someone older and they're just on fire and they want it. Their problems need to become our problems. Their questions need to become our questions. We need to invest in them right now. When people are coming with the questions that we just don't know, we can let them know that we just don't know. But we can let them know that I promise that if you trust in who Jesus claims to be, the big questions that you have will get answered. That we are a sinner, but we are loved, and we can have salvation in him. When we're getting corrected by someone with something that we've done, we can use the sermon to see if they are coming to us truly in love, and we can take time to respond in love. We can look at ourselves and see how we're living and see if this is someone that God is bringing to our lives to remind us, hey, this is not what we are supposed to be doing. And for them coming to us in love, we can respond in love. How do we respond when people bring this God that we love to us? Are we afraid? Are we terrified? Are we disturbed? Or do we come to it with joy? Do we come to it with excitement? Someone is talking about my God, rather good, bad, or indifferent. Hey, let me engage with them. Let me be happy about it, because it all should be to glorify him, amen? When the situation comes up, we know how to handle it. We have the spirit in us. Amen. amen. <laughs> when we hear about God, we should get excited. We should be encouraged. We should be full of joy. Herod is disturbed because he wants to worship. The wise men were determined because they got to worship. When you hear about God, you've heard about love, and we should respond with an attitude as such. So number one, are we afraid to hear from God? Number two, do we know what the Bible says? Verses four to six. So he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people and asked them where the Messiah would be born. In Bethlehem of Judah, they told him, because this is what was written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, and by no means least among the rulers of Ju Judah, because out of you we co will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Harold had questions about the Messiah, so he went to the people who knew about the coming of the Messiah. But how did they have this special knowledge? They didn't. It doesn't say that he went to a prophet and the prophet says, thus saith the Lord and this and that like we read in other places. No, he has the chief priest who were the high ranking members of the Sanhedrin then, pretty much the lawmakers. And it says he has the scribes, what were like the, the priests of that day. He had questions about God and he went to the people that were supposed to know about God. And how did they know about God? They knew what God's word said. We all know God because he either showed himself to us in his word or someone told us about him, who told them about him, who told them about them, all from his word. So do we know what God's word says? Now, of course, let's clarify because I'm not saying we need to know every single Bible of the book. I'm up here every month saying if you don't know, you say you don't know. The more I study, the more I realize I don't know. <laughs> what I'm saying is, excuse me, I'm, and I'm not saying that God can't talk through us through the Spirit. There's been too many instances that I've heard and I know in my life that the more we get sanctification through Christ and the Spirit lives in us, God will talk to us more and more and it will become more clear and clear. So I'm not saying none of that stuff can happen at all. What we know is when we have a thought or feeling or question about anything regarding this life, he's given us the answer to how to handle every situation. And those answers are in his word, are in the scriptures, are in the Bible that we have. 
So the question isn't how well we know our Bible, it's do we know our Bible. Clear as mud, right? We're not talking about can you find Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. We're saying can you talk about the death, burial, and resurrection? Are you a pre, mid, or post when it comes to Jesus is coming back? Or are we out to proclaiming, hey, Jesus is coming back? Do we know the stories of the Bible? Or do we know the story of the Bible? How he was here from the beginning, created man and seen us fail and knew that we could not save ourselves. So he came to be with us, to live a life we couldn't live, to die a death we couldn't die, and to save the souls we couldn't save. Jesus paid it, and faith in him save, excuse me, saves us all. That's what the Bible says. And Harold went to them because they knew what the word said. Again, verse 6, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, and by no means least among the rulers of Judah, because of out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. He's quoting Micah, verse five, uh, chapter 5, verse 2. Old Testament Micah. The prophet. So, side note, don't let anybody tell you Jesus isn't in the Old Testament. The more you study it, he, he, he screams out of it. So that's a very easy argument to debunk. So when the question in this situation is coming from God, how can we be sure that they are truly from God? It's a very simple answer, and it will never change. It's because God's word will always back it up. The questions we have, the feelings that we have, everything we know, they change day by day by day. And we all have questions. Is this from God or is this not? The different things we do through the day. Because sometimes God is telling us to go, to be loud, to do this. And sometimes God is saying to shut up, be patient, be quiet. How do we know? It's taking time in his word and saying, See what he did here. See what he did there. And see what he's saying to us. It's not us looking at just words in these 66 books. It's understanding that this is breathed by God. And if we really want to know, he will tell us. Amen? God, is this you? Let's see what you said. God, should I do this? What would Jesus do? God, I want to know what this life's about. Well, let's study what the author of it says. So are we afraid to hear from God? Do we know what the Bible says? Number three, why are we looking for God? Verses seven and eight. Then Harold secretly summoned the wise men and asked them the exact time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. When you find him, report back to me so that I too can go and worship him. It says he secretly summoned the wise men. Why? Because everyone from that region know that if he was looking for the Messiah, it truly wasn't going to, he wasn't truly going to worship him. We see from verse 13 that Harold, what he was really doing when Joseph and Mary are warned. Verse 13, after they were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, get up, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt and stay there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to kill him. He says he's looking for God to worship him, but he's really looking for God to kill him. And I think in some situations, we're kind of right there. Am I saying we're going to look for Jesus to kill him? Of course, of course not. Absolutely not. But are we following God because we love to worship him or following what comes with him because we get what we want? Why is he trying to kill the Messiah? So he can get all the worship. Are we longing for our Savior to get close to him to praise him or just close enough to him so we can try to control him? We need to sincerely ask ourselves that question and know truly how we are going to answer it. Are we here on Sundays because we want to be in God's presence? We want to talk to his people. We want to hear his word. Or do we have something going on we want, and we want to make sure he sees us here? We need to get those blessing bonus points on Sunday morning. 
I'm reading my word to truly understand you and truly see what you have for me in my life. Or is this just a check mark in my reading to make sure I did write these words and get my Bible plan filled out? I'm praying just to talk to you, just to be in your presence, just to know my Father. Or is it becoming a wish list? And there's just so many things on my mind. Let me make sure I take time to talk to him so he can hear the different things I have planned to tell him. Why do we want this God? There's plenty out there to choose from, right? It's what the world tells us. You know, we lie to ourselves and the world in saying that I want, I really want this. When really we don't want him, we just want what we can get. And I think that gets so clouded over a lot because once we do get him, we are so blessed and then we hold on to the blessings, but not the blesser. And that doesn't just happen. You can't just fix that just thinking about it because you're not going to think about it. That is where the time that comes in in his presence. And he will show you, no, it's not about the blessings. It is about me. Are we playing along in life and acting like we really want him? but just don't want to lose what we get for even saying that we are a believer? Are we lying to ourselves? Are we living this life for him or living the life for the blessings? Do we want heaven because it's not hell or do we want heaven because Jesus is there? What if those blessings fade? What if there are no more luxuries? What if it's not cool to be a Christian no more? There's a lot of stuff, of course, against us, but for the most part, you can say you're a Christian and, and everybody's okay about it. But what if that goes away? What if the social protection that we have come to grow and accustomed to gets taken away and we become what the world truly wants us to be, the enemy, which is everywhere overseas for the most part? Are we still going to look forward towards Jesus when all of that is away? A lot of us just see the blessings and almost can't even see Jesus no more. We're just following what we know because we are so blessed. But what, when, and if that happens, those things start get taken away. And we see this true Messiah that we grasp it to at first. What is going to happen? If the true Jesus is who we are following then hate is going to be everywhere that we go. Lies are coming there. Hurt is coming there. Pain is coming there. Death is coming there. It's not coming from him, but it's coming because of him. The world's looking for Christians to show them up, and they're looking for Christ to take him down. The world loves looking for where Christ is at, and since they can't find him, they come to us. So do we want all that comes with this life of Christ? I think as believers, we just, we just really don't think a lot of that. Do we understand what we are claiming, what we are following, especially if we've been doing it for a while? It may not be that we're not saved or anything like that, but do we know what we're calling ourselves to every day we wake up and go outside? Those days when we just don't feel like it, we don't feel like talking, we don't feel like doing anything. No, we have a responsibility. And our responsibility is to go wherever Christ takes us and whatever he says do, stay on him no matter what. The blessings are bonuses. We thank God for them. We thank God for everything he has. But are we doing it for this? Or are we doing it for him? I can get close to him to control the narrative. I want the worship. I want to be king. I want this job, I want the likes, I want the relationship, I want the I in Christ. Or are we looking for the fullness of Jesus? To give to him, to worship him, and to trust in him as the wise men did. Because baby, carpenter, or the risen savior, he is enough. I'm not here for the blessings of Jesus. I'm following him for the blood that was shed for me. Amen? Are we afraid to hear from him? Do we know what the Bible says? 
Why are we looking for God? And lastly, what do we do when God reminds us he's in control? Verses 16, 18. Then Harold, when he realized that he had been outwitted by the wise men, flew into a rage. He gave orders to massacre all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under. Then what was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Roma, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be consoled because they are no more. When we're not living for God, we eventually see we should have been. Amen. You don't have to believe, be a believer long to see that. And especially the, the, the more we get into him, the more it's the little stuff that we see. That show, he, he will make it very clear the closer we get to him, the paths that we are supposed to take. You know, when we're new, we really just don't know. And a lot of the ways that we take, God will kind of, steer us away. But when we get into him, he will make it very clear because we do have a responsibility. He knows us. He knows our heart. And when we fail, he makes it pretty clear when we do. God shows us he's God by any and everything. And when our intentions are not aligned with him, he shows us what he wants to get done will still get done. He will show us that if he has to play God with everything going around, he will show us who is in control. Harold did everything right to get what he wanted. And it was all going to come the way he wanted it to, to come to fruition. The wise men listen. They believe he wanted to worship the king of all kings that they were going to find. They take the journey. They find him. They rejoice. They worship. They believe. And we're probably so happy because it was better than anything they truly even could have imagined. Finding the king that they have been waiting for. They couldn't wait to tell that king that they have found the Messiah. And after they gave their gifts and were about to go report back to the king, verse 12, and being warned in a dream not to go back to Harold, they returned to their own country by another route. If we are following the footsteps of Christ, then we can rest assured that he knows what's up ahead. If we are walking the paths toward God, whatever way he is leading us, we know it is the right way. That is one thing that we do not have to worry about. Even if the road is more painful, even if it's darker, even if it's harder, even if it's more lonely, even if it looks like there's just no chance this can be right, this, ha this is hurtful, this is bad, this does not feel good. But if we are following Christ, if we are in tune with the Spirit and we know this is the way He wants us to go, we can rest assured that He knows what's exactly at the end. The wise men had no clue what was going on until Christ intervened. But because they were following him, because they were looking for him, Christ took care of it. That should give us so much peace, especially even when we think we're going down the wrong path, when something's not looking right. A, because God, if we are on the wrong path, he can make some shortcuts to get to the right one. Amen. That is one thing we just do not have to worry about if we are following him. Them times that we're scared, them times that we are hurt, those painful times where it's like there's nothing else that's going to be able to take this. It doesn't even, it's not even sometimes a quick one. Sometimes they are long journeys, but if we stay on there and we stay on there, we know what's at the end because he has told us what's at the end. Him. And whatever is at the end is going to glorify him. So it is the right path. Walk with, God to get the, walk with God to get on the path of confidence because everything that we can do with trusting in him, he will take all of the fear and the terror and every time we're disturbed away. See, sometimes life with God doesn't look clear. The other path looks clear. 
It looks easier. It looks a whole lot better. But we have to stop relying on what we can see because we can only see what's in front of us. We have to trust to see the person that can see everything else. Amen? And that is hard for us. We're told we have to know what's going forward because we don't know what's going to happen, right? And of course, in some regards, that's true. But in the times where we're really worrying or we just don't know this and that and we just really don't have an answer, we have to do the opposite of what we see Harold done. We shouldn't be afraid when God is coming to us with a situation because we know it's God. We have this scripture to go back to to comfort us and to give us the answer to how to handle situations. We can always look towards these paths of Christ and know they are the right ones because we know who created them. The world is going to tell us everything else. We just have to trust in where the Spirit is leading us. The wise men trusted in God. Harold trusted in himself. And because of this, his ask wasn't answered. His asks wasn't answered. I feel like I didn't enunciate. So, so how did he respond when he didn't get his way? Verse 16. <clears throat> Again, he gave orders to massacre all the boys in, all the, in and around Bethlehem who were two years and under in keeping with the same, in keeping with the time he had learned from the wise men. When God doesn't give us what we want, how do we respond? Do we trust that he is God and know what needs to happen? Or do we see that it was wrong and then try to go and do it again? Herod was shown up, and he wasn't going to have it. He wanted God dead. And since it didn't work the first time, he revamped it up and went at it again, trying to kill everything that even might be God. It's around this time that King Herod was, was sick. We don't know exactly what kind of disease, but he was in a terrible, painful situation, and it's, called, and it's told that he was making some really crazy choices. So historians believe this fits right into kind of what he was doing. But killing all of, a lot of toddlers in the whole entire region, that's pretty crazy even for him. See, when God tells us no once, and we don't take it for an answer, we try to get it again, but we start moving that line a little more towards us and a little less from God. And what it reminds us, listen, is when we get the answer no, and then we still try, we have to truly recognize, speak with the Spirit, is it from God or is this just something that I want? Because a, a lot of times God will chop that right there and say no, but we still really want it, so we kind of wiggle room around it to just see, is this what we're supposed to do? And a lot of times we know it's a no. And that is showing us that it is not our desire to do this for God. It was really our desire for ourself. Every step we take should be to glorify God. And when that step gets blocked, it is no longer a path toward God. We try to remove the caution tape from there and take two steps up, and God is saying, no, trust me. The wise men were going and had no idea what was going on then. We all have in our mind right now exactly where God wants us to go or where we think he wants us to go. And God has everything planned right now. That part we do not have to worry about. All he is saying is go. When you hear from me, go. When I tell you to stop, stop. Stay in my presence. Be with me. I will take care of the rest. He just asks us when we see him in anywhere conversations out there on the radio anything take time with him and he will make it clear amen we need to realize that and we need to preach that because we are too worried about everything going on especially this season we know everything there's a lot going on and there's stuff that needs to be done but do we think that God doesn't know that do we think God is worried about any of it that should give us so much peace going out here. Yes, I have to do this. Yeah, I think I have to do that. But God, you know, you have this path. You will make everything clear. Harold tried once and, got and has got his plan blocked. 
Harold tried again, and it got blocked again, but there were consequences. Because God will not be mocked, and Harold did that every step of the way. But the problem is that us as believers, we need to realize that that is not the life for us. We can clearly see everything he did, God stopped it right there. The wise men didn't have to do anything but go, and he took care of the rest. End on these verses. And I want them to just kind of resonate in everything we are doing this season. We should never be afraid to hear from God because Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. We should dwell on what the scripture said because 1 Timothy 3, 16, all scripture is inspired by God. We need to be looking for the true heart of God because we know 1 John 4, 8, God is love. And we need to trust when he shows who he is, even when we don't like it. Isaiah 55, 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. God got this. We don't have to worry. We just have to trust in him. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, this season, it's a bunch of good things, a bunch of your good people in scriptures. And today we had to look at one that wasn't. But that shouldn't be discerning or put us down at all because that's exactly what scripture is. That's exactly actually what you are. You're good, you're great, you are perfect but you're also just. You are a holy God. And we should take comfort in that. We should, know that, that no, we should know that no matter what is happening, you will take care of what needs to take care of, take, being taken care of. We just need to go and trust in you. Father God, show us uh, every step that we take. <laughs> Give us confirmation that it is truly from you. Let it be on our minds that every single thing that we want to do is truly just to give you glory. When we see you, let us go. When we hear about you, let us listen. When we have questions on you, let us learn. Let us be the example you want us to be. If we're in that situation, you put us in that situation. And you will let what needs to be done. So Father God, this season, give us the peace that we need. Let us do what we need to do, but know that you will take care of what we can. Let us not worry about what's ahead because we know you're already there. And let us learn that through discernment, in your word, in your presence, just knowing you. Let us not look for you to control you. Let us not look for you to get rid of you. Let us not look for you to just get what we want from you. Let us look for you because we want you and know that you are enough. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.